This video is about number systems. So we need different types of numbers to do different things for us. So natural numbers, for example, are the counting numbers and there are positive whole numbers and they can be used to solve some linear equations like x equals to two. But not every linear equation has a positive whole number solution. So we need to expand into the integers, which are positive and negative whole numbers, which could do the job of solving something like x plus 2 equals to 0. So I can get a negative whole number answer for that. So minus 2 is an element of the integer set. But that still doesn't cover everything because we might have rational numbers. So they're represented by the symbol q. And that's coming from the word quotient. And they are numbers that can be written in the form a over b where a and b are themselves integers, but b, of course, can't be zero because we can't divide by zero within a fraction. And they would solve equations like, say, 3x equals to 2. So my solution there would be x equals 2 over 3, which is an element of the rational number set. But that doesn't still cover everything because we also have numbers that go beyond that. So we have thirds and we have non-terminating, non-recurring decimals that can't be written in fraction form. So we want to expand to cover those. And that then will be, well, first of all, the set of irrational numbers are the extra numbers that we need. And they're basically numbers that are not uh, rational numbers. And they'd be needed to solve things like, say, for example, x squared minus 2 equals to 0. So x squared equals 2 and then x equals positive or negative root 2. So I'm now into these guys, which are thirds, and they're a member of the irrationals. Now, they're not the only type of irrationals. You have values like pi as well, um, but the thirds are the ones that I'm going to just focus on in that particular example. And if you take rational and irrational numbers together, they form the group of real numbers, and real numbers are essentially all of these guys that we've seen already grouped together, okay? And except for or without Q, each is a subset of the previous set, or of the, sorry, of the subsequent set. So if we visualize how this would look then as a Venn diagram, imagine that we've got all the numbers that exist, and within that we start off with the natural number set. So the natural number set would include for example, the numbers 2 and 1 and so on. I'm going to stick in my 2 for my solutions from earlier. But obviously, there's an infinite number of elements inside in that set. And then that natural number set is contained within the integer set. So that positive number there in the natural number set, it's a natural number, but it's an integer as well. And my solution from the previous examples, minus 2, would be an example of a negative number that fits into that extra portion of the integer number set but obviously again it's not the only element and then when I go to draw my next set that's going to be my rational numbers q and so there is q and so q contains all the whole numbers because say for example 2 could be written as 2 over 1 so it's possible to write it as a fraction it contains all the negative whole numbers so it contains all the integers and then of course it has the extras such as the 2 over 3 that I mentioned earlier on. And then expanding out again, we've got our real numbers. And real numbers contain all the previous sets. And of course, then they also contain things like root two, which are our thirds. You'll see here that my universal set doesn't just contain the real numbers. There's a space over here that I've left on purpose because this space is going to be taken up in a little while by information from the new chapter that we're looking at, which is the complex numbers chapter. But before I get into looking at complex numbers as a group, I want to first of all introduce the imaginary numbers. So we've looked at the different types of numbers as being, I suppose, um, numbers that we need to be able to solve particular different types of equations. Well, the imaginary numbers are the exact same. So when I'm thinking about imaginary numbers, I'm trying to think about the numbers that I would need to solve another problem. And the type of equation that I might be looking at in that scenario would be something like x squared equals to minus 1. Okay, so if I wanted to work that out, 
I'm going to say the square root of minus 1. But if I put that into my calculator, the calculator won't cope with it. It'll give me back an error message. So there's something up with this root minus 1. It's something that I haven't seen before. And as it turns out, this root of negative 1 is actually the building block of our new imaginary numbers set. And since it's quite difficult to work with the roots of negative numbers, as you've seen dealing with the calculator whenever they've arisen in the past, we're actually going to give this guy a name. And we're going to call him i. And he's the unit of imaginary numbers. Okay, And that's why I've left a gap in my diagram, because the imaginary number set goes over here. And for example, I have one i and two i and so on. And complex numbers then are just going to be a combination of real numbers and imaginary numbers. So when we say complex, we don't mean that they're complicated. We mean that they are a combination of different values from the real numbers and the imaginary numbers. So complex numbers are numbers that are written in the form x plus yi, or sometimes you might see a plus bi, where a and b themselves are integers, and where i is an element of the imaginary number set, i will always represent the square root of minus 1.